Good morning. How is everybody this morning? Okay, I hear some good things out there, so that's good. I welcome you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Since the choir is singing today, we were uh, practicing. We, on, on the Sundays we sing, we usually try to be here at nine and have a, a little extra uh, run through of the song, a time or two, and then a prayer afterwards. And, and in her prayer, um, uh, Tricia compared uh, the choir singing to the, the birds uh, singing praise. Uh, and, uh, and the beauty outside, and we are thankful for the beauty. We are thankful for the birds. We are thankful for the opportunity to sing praises to our God. Uh, you can see the announcements that are listed in the worship folder here. One of them not listed, uh, the, the choir and a few other folks will be going over to uh, uh, Polo Rehab this afternoon uh, for Vespers services. Those typically run from 4 to 4.30. Even if you're not actually involved in something that's going on with Vespers, whether it's the choir and a larger group going or, or just me, you're always welcome to come along. And even if you're not in the service itself, it, the, the residents like to have just have people there, different people to see and different people to interact with, and so you're always welcome. We'll be there this afternoon at four o'clock. Uh, the things that we have listed, the 15th and 16th, I, I have clarified the schedule. I will be here in the morning uh, tomorrow during office hours, and in the afternoon then I will be leaving uh, and I'll be out of town the rest of the day and on Tuesday uh, for uh, some ministry training. It's our required uh, district ethics uh, ministerial training. Uh, for the year, and so I'll be uh, out of town for that. Uh, looking ahead to uh, this coming Saturday at 10 o'clock, uh, it says 10 p.m., it should be 10 a.m., so make a note of that, uh, because if you come at 10 p.m., I and almost everyone else will miss you. Uh, that's going to be the leadership team uh, this coming Saturday. Next week is our week uh, for secondhand rows. Uh, the choir will be practicing on Thursday the 25th. Uh, Saturday the uh, 27th is uh, a Creation Care event at the Highland Avenue Church of the Brethren. I know Creation Care, stewardship and environmental issues is something this congregation has been involved with uh, in the past. Uh, you can see details on that that's on the, the bulletin board in the narthex, so be sure you check that out. Also on the 27th between 2 and 5, uh, there'll be a celebration of life uh, for Paul Wooden. You're uh, invited to stop by uh, Mark Marsha's home and, uh, and be a part of that and visit and share memories and share, uh, share thoughts and, and uh, celebrate Paul and the things he meant to us and to the community. Uh, I think that uh, for announcement type things, that's uh, what I've got. Does anyone else have anything to share this morning? I see a hand, I see a hand and a mic. Hand and a <coughs> mic outweighs just a hand. Uh, all right, good morning. Um, I spoke with Karen this morning and she said the food pantry is in desperate need of mandarin oranges and pineapple. So please, if you're out and about, please consider picking those up, the oranges and the pineapple. Mandarin oranges and pineapples, thank you. I also wanna just say thank you to everyone who came to our bridal shower or helped in any way with that last week. It was very, very nice. So even if you couldn't attend, thank you for your well wishes, your cards. Um, yeah, we're just very grateful for all of you. Thank you. Thank you. On uh, this Wednesday evening, Steve and I are landscaping around the church in Parsonage. If anybody wants to join us, uh, more hands make lighter work. Uh, it's uh, 5.30 in the evening, so just uh, show up if you want to get some fresh air and exercise. You might want to bring a rake or a shovel or something, but uh, it's uh, an enjoyable time. Uh, on Thursday morning, Patty Stauffer and I are meeting with our copier, a sales representative to renew our contract or uh, decide what the future holds for our copying needs. If any of you have any specific copying needs, uh, things that you wish we had had in the past that we don't, uh, now's the time to let your feelings be known before Thursday morning that we can use your input uh, in deciding our future with our copier contract. Okay, so Wednesday at uh, 5.30 in the afternoon, uh, landscaping here at the church and at the parsonage, 
And then Thursday morning, uh, Patty and Elmer will be uh, meeting with copier representative, and if you have thoughts about that, let, let one of them know. Thank you. Anyone else? I don't see anyone, so I'll invite you to uh, join me in our hymn. If you need the tune, it's number 120, verses 1, 3, and 4, Holy, Holy, Holy. You're welcome to stand if you wish. I invite you to remain standing. Join me in the prayer of invocation that you see here in our worship folder. Uh, please pray with me. Oh God, the Bible teaches that you are the author of our faith. May we live that faith the way you want us to. May we seek your will and your guidance. May we know your presence, not just in service, but in every part of our lives. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Uh, you can see the uh, prayer concerns that we have listed here in the worship folder. Uh, the, uh, the district uh, prayer concern uh, for this week is the district ministry leadership development team and uh, TRIM, which stands for Training in Ministry which, as you would guess, is for ministers in training. The, uh, the, the TRIM program is part of the Brethren Academy for Ministerial Leadership. Uh, it's a, a pro, the Brethren Academy is something that's designed and it's operated primarily on a district basis, although they do do some work with uh, Bethany Seminary, and it's designed for people who are in, interested in exploring ministry. Uh, but if you go to, if you like want to go to Bethany and get a, a full-fledged degree, and it's, it's a master's, and so you, have, you, you typically have to have a bachelor's in order to do that. And while there are options that, that if you're ever interested, let you go to Bethany and, and graduate at the end of your time there with literally no student debt which I think is an exciting thing. But even then, the, the time commitment for that to go and be in residence someplace else uh, is too much for some people. And so the Brethren Academy through the TRIM program and through other programs uh, operates uh, programs that are designed uh, to provide ministry training, but it's not at like some graduate 
theological kind of a level. Uh, it's more practically oriented, uh, and uh, it's uh, it's very, very helpful. Uh, trim Ministers that come out of the TRIM program are well-trained and are excellent, excellent pastors. I've taught for the TRIM program before. Julia has taught as a part of the TRIM program when we were in the Mid-Atlantic District, uh, and uh, it's just an excellent program. District Ministry Leadership Development, uh, that's part of what I'll be doing this weekend with uh, training in ministerial ethics. Uh, but they also they provide a lot of different uh, leadership development programs uh, for people exploring ministry and for people like me and some others who are involved in ministry. Uh, and it's important work and it's difficult work. It's work that is sometimes behind the scenes. Uh, so we are thankful for them and glad for them. Uh, we have a number of other things uh, that we pray for or continue in prayer for. We continue in prayer for Bill and uh, for Betty Hare. Uh, some of you may know that uh, their son Bill was involved in an auto accident this, uh, this past week, uh, was not seriously, seriously injured, but, but uh, was is, was certainly sore uh, and had some minor injuries from that. It could have been a lot worse. It was a bad accident. Uh, so we are, uh, uh, we are in prayer for them and we're in prayer for him as well. Uh, we continue in prayer for Pam Lindsley. Uh, we, in prayer for Donna uh, Humphreys, uh, has had a, uh, a recurrence of some of the, the dizziness and the fainting that she has had a, a history of in the past. And so we'll be in prayer for her and for the doctors as they try to work through what's going on there. Uh, many of you uh, saw in the news, I'm sure, that uh, Iran launched a uh, missile and drone attack on Israel over the past couple of days. Uh, we are in prayer uh, for that situation. Uh, the previous attack from, uh, from Hamas onto Israel uh, back in October made things terrible, and this uh, doesn't help them in any way. We pray that peace can prevail, uh, not just there, uh, but in all sorts of conflicts, large and small, around the world and in our communities and in our families. I had the opportunity yesterday, or last night rather, to uh, go to uh, Polo uh, High School and see the high school drama club do their improv night. And that was fun, got to see Beth, and, and uh, I, we appreciate, by the way, Beth being here to share with our choir this morning. Uh, we're glad for that. And it was fun to see uh, the students uh, practicing improvisate, learning uh, and doing improvisation. For those, improvisation is essentially where you're given like a brief framework of something, and then you have to make it up from there. Uh, there's no written dialogue. There may be some general idea or theme of where it's supposed to go, but you don't have the dialogue. So you have to figure it out as you go and reacting to the other people in the improvisation and, and uh, at the same time thinking ahead about what you're going to do. There was an improv uh, TV show uh, that was around for many, many years called Whose Line Is It Anyway? Uh, and many of you may have watched that. I see a few people nodding. Uh, that was a funny, funny show, but if that's your only exposure to improv, you might think it's, it's pretty easy. You just get up there and you say what you want to say, but it is not. Uh, but they had done very, very well, and I was glad to be able to be there and, and share with them and, and share in their talents, and, and it was fun. And thank you to Beth for the work that she does in helping people develop uh, that, part of their, uh, that part of their talents and that side of their lives. We're glad for that. Uh, in addition to uh, the birds uh, singing outside, spring means it's time for uh, some uh, kids' sports. I know Emmett is uh, doing some soccer. Kennedy is doing some soccer. There are probably others that I'm not thinking of. Or, or oh, Cam is doing soccer as well. Excellent. Good for you, Cam. So uh, we're, we pray that it's a good time for all of them. Uh, and we uh, pray for safety uh, and for learning and for uh, fun and sportsmanship for all of them. Uh, we've already heard uh, mention of the, uh, the food pantry. Um, and I wrote a, oh, and uh, we've already heard mention, uh, not just thank you for the shower, but we're glad for the relationships, uh, not just relationships of love or marriage or family, but relationships of love and relationships of care as communities come together uh, to support one another. We're just really, really glad for that. Uh, does anyone else have something they'd like to share this morning? I see a hand. I had shared with the choir Thursday night, but I want to share with the rest of my faith family. I had a seizure on Wednesday morning, 
and it's the first one I've had since I've been on medication. And so it was a, a little, little scary this time. But um, it's taken me a few days to get back to feeling normal, but I feel really good today here in church with my family. And so just keep me in your prayers till I get to see my doctor. Thank you. Thank you. Are there others this morning? Good. I always forget to look over there, so I'm making sure. Okay, and, and it's the one time that she doesn't have anything. <laughs> if not, then let's uh, continue with our uh, prayer hymn, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. It's number 340, verses 1, 3, and 4. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for the gift of this day, and the gift of the ability to gather and to share with one another, with people that we love and that we care for, and the gift of the ability to gather and to share with you, to share praises, to share joys, to share thanks, to share concerns, to share worries. With each thing that we share, God, we know there are a dozen other things connected to it in one way or another. We know that for each ministry or each person or each situation that there are dozens or hundreds or thousands or even millions of other people uh, connected in some way to that event or affected in some way uh, by that event, whether a large global event or, or whether a, a small personal event. It's because we are all connected in one way or another with one another. We are all connected through the bonds of the spirit. We are all connected by being a part of this world that you have created. Help us to know and to seek and to live out and to act on those connections. Help us to recognize them where they exist in our lives. Help us to know 
if we are called to respond in some way, and if so, what that way is. And once we figure that out, God, give us the strength and give us the courage and give us the ability to respond as you call us to. We pray for the, the, the various uh, training programs for ministers and laity in the denomination and in the district, uh, particularly the district ministership, ministry leadership development program. Uh, and that team, and the uh, TRIM program for ministers in training at district and denominational levels. Uh, we celebrate uh, relationships, uh, the opportunity to gather and share support and share love with one another through showers and, and gatherings of various kinds, whatever those may be, uh, whether it's a shower or a birthday party or, or in some cases a, a, a memorial service or a celebration of life. We're glad for the opportunity to recognize and celebrate and, and support one another in those times. We pray for the ministry of the Lifeline Food Pantry, the people who serve there, the people who donate, and the people who receive service and receive important food and ministries from them. We're thankful for the gifts of nature, the gifts of beauty that you, with which you surround us. Sometimes those gifts are nature and beauty in the form of, uh, of bright flowers and green, green grass and trees and birds and animals. Sometimes it's the beauty of something we don't think of as nature, but, but people are a part of your creation. And the things that people create with the gifts that you have given them are parts of your creation as well. We don't think of cities as a part of your creation. We don't think of, a, of, of, a, of some memorial or monument someplace as a part of your creation, but it is. Everything is a part in one way or another of your creation, interconnected with you just as all of us are. We're thankful for all of those things. We're glad for the opportunities that kids have, kids like, uh, like Cam and Kennedy and, and Emmett and others to, to share in whatever their gifts or their talents or their abilities may be, whether it's uh, athletic through soccer, whether it's uh, through, uh, through acting and improvisation, whether it's through science or math or technology or English or history or any number of other things, God. We're glad for the opportunity that they have to share their gifts and we're glad for the, for, the, for the staff and parents and administrators and teachers and coaches that make all of that possible. We pray for, uh, for, for Donna as she uh, and her doctors work through what, what, the, what it means that uh, she, her seizures uh, may have returned after, a, uh, after this long a time. We pray for strength and for guidance for her. We pray that she knows your presence in her life. Uh, as she goes through these things. We pray that not just for her, but for others who suffer with different ailments, whether it's uh, Pam Lindsley or Bill and Betty Hare or their son Bill as he recovers from an auto accident or any number of other people that we have not mentioned this morning but could have mentioned. Uh, we pray for, pray for the for peace, uh, not just in our own lives, not just in the lives of our friends or families, but around the world. Most recently, with Iran's uh, attack on Israel, help, help people to know as they make decisions uh, as leaders of government what your will is for them. As they make decisions, as they try to decide how to respond, as they try to decide what next steps are, help them to work through that. Even those who do not believe in you, we know from the Bible that you can speak to people who do not believe in you, and that you can work through people who are not Christians, who do not have a relationship with you. We pray that you would do that now, and we pray that those people through whom you work would be open to that leading and would be open to your spirit and to your guidance. We pray for other things, God, too numerous to mention, uh, both within our hearts and, and in the world around us. Hear our prayers, heal our wounds, and forgive our sins. As we pray in Jesus' name, amen. We do celebrate all the different kinds of gifts that people have and all the different kinds of gifts that, uh, that people bring. And the, 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 when we think about our offerings, it's a good time to remember all of those gifts. 
Uh, and uh, whatever your gifts are, you either use them now uh, in terms of generating money for your family and yourself and your family's support and your homes and, and money to share, or you have used them in the past for that. And that happens as, as we help one another and as God helps us to recognize and develop all the different gifts that we've been given. Uh, we will share now of some of, the, uh, some of the fruits of those gifts that God has given us, those talents and those skills God has given us. The ushers will wait upon you and receive your tithes and your offerings as we sing number 226. You are the salt of the earth. Dear God, we do bring forth the kingdom of mercy, the kingdom of justice, the kingdom of peace, the kingdom of love, and the kingdom of God as we share our gifts. So the ushers aren't just bringing forth checks and coins and bills and whatever it may be. They are bringing forth our gifts. And through them, we pray that you will use us and them to bring forth the kingdom of God. In Jesus' name, amen.
We have uh, two scripture readings this morning. Uh, the first, uh, I'll be preaching primarily on the second one, but the, the first one helps to provide a little bit of context. That's Psalm number four. Answer me when I call to you, my righteous God. Give me relief for my distress. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. How long will your people turn my glory into shame? How long will you love delusions and, and seek false gods? Know that the Lord has set apart his faithful servant for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. Tremble, do not sin. And when you are on your bed, search your hearts and be silent. Offer the sacrifices of the righteous and trust in the Lord. Many, Lord, are asking, who will bring us prosperity? Will let the light of your face shine on us. Fill my heart with joy when their grain and their new wine abound. And in peace I will lie down and sleep. For you alone, Lord, make me dwell in safety. Our second reading is from uh, Acts, the third chapter, Acts chapter 3, verses 1 uh, through 19. One day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. And now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was uh, put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. And when he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. And then Peter said, look at us. And so the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. And then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have. But what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. And he jumped to his feet and began to walk, and then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. And when all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as that same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at, at what had happened to him. And, and while the man held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. And when Peter saw this, he said to them, well, fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? 
Why do you uh, stare at us as if by our own power or our own godliness we had made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed. You disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the holy and righteous one and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. And by faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him, as you can all see. Now, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders, but this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Messiah would suffer. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out and that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. There are two um, contenders for the title of best selling author of all time. I'm not counting God. Uh, although God, through the Holy Spirit and various humans, wrote the Bible, uh, that's, and that the Bible is in all of its different translations and all of its different publications over hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years is the best-selling book of all time. That's still not quite the same thing because, as I said, it's lots of different translations and different times, and so it's really it's a lot of different books. So I'm not counting God. Uh, aside from God, the two authors who have sold the most books over the years are first this man who knows who he is. Shakespeare, William Shakespeare, right? Uh, and then the second who, uh, uh, you, you can't tell for sure, but going by Wikipedia, this second person may actually have sold as many or more books over the years than Shakespeare. The second person is this woman, who is she? Julia knows, Maggie knows, big fan, Agatha Christie. Agatha Christie, well, Shakespeare, of course, he wrote plays and poetry and sonnets in the 1500s and 1600s. Christie wrote mysteries. She wrote both novels, she wrote short stories, she wrote a couple of plays, uh, all of them in the 20th century. Her two main detectives are named, were, they still are in the books, named Miss Jane Marple and Hercule Poirot. There have been three Hercule Poirot movies in the last five or six years. There's a fourth one in the works. Agatha Christie wrote her first Poirot story in 1916. It was published in 1920. When she was creating the detective, she gave him some very distinctive attributes and distinctive habits. That makes sense to me. I've never tried to write uh, fiction like that, but I would think it would be easier if you're creating a fictional character and trying to think of things for that character to do, to, to, to do that with someone who has some unique qualities about them rather than someone who is just kind of bland and, and average. You automatically have things to do for a character who likes to cook or who is a professional athlete, or who has a great sense of humor, or who has some uh, unusual physical characteristic, as opposed to a character who doesn't really stand out in any way. Christie gave Poirot a number of different characteristics, some physical, some mental. The only actor who has played Poirot in adaptations of all of Christie's stories is this man, his name is David Suchet. Uh, and he looks very, very much like the way Poirot is described in the books. Uh, in the books, he's described as about 5'4". He's described as having a head shaped exactly like an egg, uh, a mustache that he grows out and then waxes to a point. Uh, he always dresses very formally except for those few times that he uh, goes uh, undercover. Other than that, he always dresses very, very formally, much like this. Uh, he wears patent leather shoes with spats. His, uh, his stomach is very, very sensitive. Uh, he always likes things to be in balance. He, he would never have a bookshelf with like seven books here and four books here. He would have to rearrange them. He would realize that that means there are 11 books, so would he have to go out and get another 
another book so that there could be six on each side. I mean, that's kind of how Poirot does things. He's a genius, he knows he's a genius, and he doesn't mind telling you that he knows he's a genius. I mean, there's more, but you get the picture. Uh, the new Poirot movies star this actor, his name is Kenneth Branagh, and you may have seen him in, in a lot of things over the years. He's primarily a movie and theater actor, and as you can tell just by the just by the pictures, he's, uh, he's giving it a, a, a different spin. He's playing it differently than David Suchet did. The next movie he is doing is it's in production now, and it is an adaptation of Julia's least favorite Christie book. It's called The Murder of Roger Ackroyd. Uh, and so if I end up seeing that movie, it will be sometime when Julia is not around. All of these little eccentricities and little habits and little quirks, they make Poirot easier to write about. At least they did at first. The author could get some comic relief out of Poirot's being uh, upset when his shoes get muddy, muddy or, or make him look a little bit silly by insisting that everything in a room be arranged symmetrically or make him seem like an egoist when he pointed out how he had been right and the police and everyone else had been wrong. In real life, you know, we, we all know people that have some little odd quirk about them, some little habit, and, and, uh, and, and it's okay. It's okay. First, we all have those kind of things. And second, it, it sometimes may seem funny or endearing at first, but after a while, uh, what might seem funny or endearing may just kind of become annoying, and we may get tired of it. Uh, the first Poirot book, as I said, was published in 1920. By 1930, Christie said that she found Poirot insufferable. In 1960, she described him as a detestable, bombastic, tiresome, egocentric little creep. Agatha Christie could not stand what it was she had created. But she kept on writing Poirot stories, even though by the end of her career she didn't need the money, but he was very, very popular, since she is maybe the best-selling author in the world, after with Shakespeare. Public demanded it, the public wanted it, and she thought, as her duty, it was, as an author, she felt it was her duty to write things that people wanted to read, especially when other people had fallen so much in love with this character. Christie, in her very last book, uh, killed off Hercule Poirot uh, in the book Curtain, uh, which was published in 1975, and that was just, uh, just a year before Christie herself died. We don't often think of God in the same way we think of authors, but Peter referred to it here in our scripture reading from Acts, and a lot of the attributes that we ascribe to God are similar to things we would say about an author. God created us, God created our world, uh, God uh, uh, like, is like an author who has to create a character, and then a world for that character to live in. There have to be other characters to interact with. I interacted with a, a whole different set of people five years ago. Now I interact with you and other people in Polo and Dixon and Sterling and Mount Morris. You know, In a work of fiction, the character and the world are all created by the authors. Now that may be based on a real place. If you read like the, the Spencer books, for instance, they're set in Boston. Uh, the Nero Wolfe stories are, are set in New York City. There are some authors that write historical fiction and, and they will use like real people as characters in their books. Uh, but the author still creates other characters and the situations within that real setting that still makes it its own unique world. We sometimes talk about God having a plan, either a, a plan for creation or a plan for the world or, or a plan for our lives. Well, if, it, if we think about it as an author, what's the difference between a plan and a plot? Where will the hero go? Who will she talk to when she gets there? What will happen to him? Uh, how will the hero get out of whatever trouble they're in? Will there be a happy ending? Will there be a tragic ending? Will there be a cliffhanger so that we have to buy the next book? Uh, people have different ideas about the kind of detail in which God plans our lives. And as creatures, 
that God created. We have, God gave us the gift, for better or for worse, of free will. And we can, and we know people who do ignore God's wills, and we, we can do that if we choose. Whatever your specific belief about the detail or, or level of the plan, it's, it's still not a great deal different than what an author does with the character they have created and the world they have created for that character to live in. There's another sense in which God is like an author as well. Think about that song we sang earlier, you are salt for the earth. Where'd that come from? Uh, we haven't talked about salt this morning. Um, if some of you maybe were talking about your breakfast uh, and put too much salt on something or had bacon and loved how salty and, and crisp it was. So maybe you've talked about salt, but I haven't talked about salt with anyone this morning. I haven't had anything particularly salty. The scripture reading isn't about food or, or condiments or seasoning or anything like that. So where'd that salt thing come from? Well, many of you know, many of you know, you recognize that it's a reference to Jesus' words in the Sermon on the Mount. Where in Matthew 5, 13, he says, you are the salt of the earth. Now, if you didn't recognize it, that's okay, but many of us did. Why? Because we've heard the story of Jesus and we've read the Sermon on the Mount before. If out of the blue, I'm talking to you and I say something about Noah's Ark, would you know what I was talking about? If I mention Adam and Eve, would you know what I'm talking about? Even though we haven't mentioned those things at all, until just now during the service, uh, many of you would know the stories behind them. Most of you probably. You've heard the stories about the names that, that those refer to. The Bible is filled with stories. The Bible is filled with stories of people and stories of events and stories of countries and stories of animals and stories of lives and deaths, stories of which God is the author. The lame beggar, in our scripture reading, laid near the beautiful gate of the second temple, which is the temple that was in place when Jesus was alive and was destroyed 30 or 40 years uh, by the Romans after this story happened. Now, we really don't know for sure which gate that was. This is a picture of uh, one of the exterior gates of the temple. Uh, I believe this is called the one that's called the Golden Gate. The beautiful gate might have been one of the bigger exterior gates, uh, like this one, uh, or it might have been a smaller interior gate. It talks about the, the colonnade of, uh, uh, of Solomon, and some people think it was a gate near the colonnade of Solomon. This particular picture uh, is showing it as an exterior gate. Uh, but, but it could have been an interior gate as well. We just don't know. God was the author of the lame beggar's life. He may not have known that. He may not have thought about it that way, but, but it's true. God was the author as well of Peter and John's lives. God was the author of parables about salt and light. God was the author of the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And in our reading from Acts, uh, Peter recognizes that Jesus as the Messiah is a part of God. And he talks about Jesus as being the author of life. And Peter's sermon makes clear that in rejecting Jesus, in demanding the release of Barabbas, in allowing and even, even encouraging Jesus to be crucified, the people who worshiped at the temple had rejected the author of all these things. They had rejected the author of their own lives just as their forefathers had rejected God time and again in the Old Testament by rejecting the judges and the prophets and the law and the covenant. Jesus is God to reject. Jesus is to reject God. To reject Jesus is to reject the author of life. And we have rejected Jesus sometimes when we have not followed God's will for our lives. God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, they are one. They are the author of our lives, yours and mine. Now, I've been to a lot of weddings and wedding receptions and wedding rehearsals over the years. One of the best parts 
of the wedding, particularly if you're the person like performing the wedding and working with the couple in premarital stuff and being at the rehearsals and meeting the parents for the first time, one of the best parts is listening to the stories. There was one wedding I did uh, 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 several years ago now, probably 10 years ago, for a colleague at work, uh, where someone told a story about how the bride, who's very much an animal lover, uh, but someone in the, in the household was allergic to, to animals, so she couldn't have an animal in the house, but she would play when she was a little girl, she had imaginary kittens. She had imaginary kittens that she would play with and she would drag string along for them and dangle things and imagine them jumping up at the string that she was dangling. And one day, her big brother was mad at her and ran into her bedroom with a baseball bat and tried to kill all of her imaginary kittens. That's a great story. I mean, probably a little horrifying for her back then. But now, you know, as an adult, that's funny. That's funny, and it's funny that her, her big brother kind of thought of things that way. And I, I heard all kinds of stories that I would never have known about her or her new husband. She was my co colleague, so everything was new to me about her, uh, her husband. Stories about goats and tractors and Red Robin restaurants and blind dates, all sorts of stories about the, the bride and the groom and other friends and family who were there. You know, all of those stories were written by Jesus, by the author of life. And in celebrating those stories, sharing those stories, laughing and loving and living out of those stories, the bride and the groom and their family and their friends found joy and happiness and laughter. What kinds of stories has Jesus authored here among us? Uh, we refer to dis distinguished institutions or distinguished people will say they have a long and storied history. Uh, certainly that description would, would fit the Polo Church of the Brethren, would fit this congregation. Do we believe that we have a story to tell about this congregation? Not just a story about our past, not just a story about our history, but a story about our present and our future. Do we live our lives in, in such a way that we actually tell that story? Or would the people that we know at work or school or the rest of our lives be surprised to learn that we worship on a little at a little church on Congress Avenue that believes war is sin and believes in bringing forth God's kingdom of justice and peace? Would people be surprised to hear the story of this congregation from us? Well, not just this congregation. Would people be surprised to know that we believe that God, that Jesus is the author of our lives, that God is writing a story for us and through us today and every day? Now, God's not an author like Agatha Christie who learns to hate their creation and waits for the opportunity to finally kill him off. Instead, God is an author who under the new covenant extends mercy to all of creation by giving his own son. The mercy of God through the sacrifice and the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the story of Easter, a story we celebrated just a couple of weeks ago. Do we tell that story in our lives? Do we live as if our author, our God, is a, a merciful and compassionate God? Do we live as people who forgive, who, who turn the other cheek, who could let go of grudges and hard feelings? Do we live as if we believe something that sometimes is harder than forgiving others? Do we live as if we believe that we have forgiven ourselves and that God has forgiven us? Do we tell a story of mercy, of grace, of reconciliation with God in our words and on our deeds, peace and mercy and grace for others and peace and mercy and grace for us? Or would folks be surprised to hear that story from us? Jesus is the author of the stories of John and Peter and the lame man at the beautiful gate. Jesus is the author of that healing. Jesus is the author of life. Do we reject him as so many others have before us? Or do we embrace him 
and tell the story and live the story. Amen. Our closing song is uh, number 546, if you need the tune in the hymnal. It's Guide My Feet. The lyrics, as you can see, are divided into like a call and response thing, but we're all just going to sing all the lyrics. You're welcome to stand if you wish. Go now with God, go in peace. Amen.